Hi guys, welcome back. We're looking today at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek. We're in section 9.4, right at the end of chapter 9. And this is entitled Conjunctions. Really what it's about is some slightly surprising, though quite common, features of conjunctions. And it's important we get our head around these. The best way for me to show you is just to give you some examples. And so what I'm going to do is take a bunch of examples from the end of this section, from practice 9.4 on page 107. And in each one, I'll show you some of the features of these conjunctions and you'll be able to work through it with me. That will also give us the benefit of practicing some of the stuff that we've already done. So without further ado, let's look first at post-positive conjunctions. Now, I'll explain what that means first and then I'll show you in here. A post-positive word is a word that cannot appear and never appears first in a clause or in a sentence. It always appears second. But when you translate it into English, that feature disappears. We don't use post-positive conjunctions, or none of our conjunctions are post-positive, and therefore you need to remember to move the word, one word back in the sentence. Let me show you what I mean in practice. Let's read this example, number one. Poloi episteusan hoi ga mathertai. Well, here's a word to practice your pronunciation with. Euangelizonto. Euangelizonto. Three peculiarities here, diphthong u, uh, e, double gamma, pronounced as an ng, uangelizonto. Okay, so let's just work our way through this. Oh, I'll show you the uh, post-positive preposition uh, conjunction first. Here it is, the word gar, which means for or because. And what you notice is that the clause in which it appears begins here with hoi, but the word itself can't appear first in the clause or in the sentence, and therefore it's, it's shifted to the second position. But when we translate it, we're going to make that kind of mental step to put it back in the first position in the clause, because it doesn't function like that in English. Okay, so let's just get on with translating it. Poloi episteusan. Well, pistuo is the root of this verb. It's aorist, epsilon augment, sigma suffix. Um, and an ending, or elusat, elusas, elusen, elusamen, eluseta, elusan, that is third person plural, so they believed, who's the they who believed? Poloi, the noun in, in the nominative, so this, where am I going to write this? Many believed, let's leave that for a second and just do the rest of this clause, because this is a little bit of a quirk, and this is um, uh, a, another good thing to help remind you of what we were doing um, in the previous chapter, this verb is uh, from euangelizomai, euangelizomai, which means I preach the gospel. But notice what's happened. The alpha has gone to an eta by virtue of the addition of an epsilon augment. This is actually a compound verb, the u there at the start of it. And then um, the ending is the third plural ending in the imperfect. So you've got the epsilon augment signaling that's in the imperfect, no sigma suffix, and uh, on, oh goodness, typo. Dear, oh dear. Hope you all spotted that. On to. <laughs> you ain't gillids on to. Oh dear. Well then, if you pick that one up. So this means they were preaching the gospel. Uh, they third person plural, were preaching, because it's imperfect, they were preaching the gospel. Who was preaching the gospel? Hoi methertai, uh, unusual noun because it's actually masculine but it looks feminine. See the video from a few sessions ago, nouns of confusing gender. Right, so what that means is the disciples were preaching the gospel. Right, okay, so now here's the point of this whole exercise. This conjunction, the post-positive gar, is written in Greek second in the clause, but in English we're just going to dunk it back up here. So for or because the disciples are preaching the gospel. So the whole sentence reads, many believe, poloi episteusan, for the disciples Hoi gar mathertai were preaching the gospel. Euangelizonto. There's your first example. Come back in a second and we'll look at men and death next. 
Okay, here's a second example. Now we're going to think about these two little timid words or post-positive words, men and death. Now, before even we go about translating this sentence and understanding what these words mean, you can already see that they fall into the same category of conjunctions as gar, that is post-positive. Notice they appear second in their respective clauses. Men, de, well, ho, men, theos, and tuflos, de, holos, laos. So, um, being post-positive, when we translate them, we're going to move them back one step like that in the sentence. Now what I'm going to do now is to read this and we'll um, translate it uh, and then I'll show you how to translate men and de at the end. So first let's ignore men and de and just translate the rest of the sentence and I'll show you how to deal with the men and de words. Okay, so hot men theos epemp sen tus profetas tuflos de holaos. Okay, so how are we going to deal with this? It's fairly straightforward, isn't it? Epempsen is from pempo, I send, epsilon augment, sigma suffix turning the pi to a psi, n is the third singular aorist ending, of course epsilon augment, sigma suffix is aorist, so that means he sent, and who's the he? Ho theos, God, in the nominative singular, so God sent, what did he send? A noun in the accusative, tus, Prophetas, the plural, accusative plural, masculine. Prophetas, masculine, accusative plural. Notice that prophetes, from which we get prophetas, is one of those nouns of confusing gender. Again, just like in the previous example, go back and check from a previous section or a couple of videos back, I think, about nouns of confusing gender if you don't get that one. This comes from prophetes and it means prophet. Okay, so God sent the prophets, again ignore men and death for the time being, to flos holaos. Well, this is an example of one of those clauses that's got an invisible amy in it, uh, an invisible verb to be. You've got two things in the nominative, clearly one is being predicated of the other. Uh, holaos is the subject because it's the only noun, so let's uh, put that in. Laos is people, to flos means blind. And are you going to say are or were? Well, the form of Amy you should choose is going to be the form of Amy that fits with the tense of the rest of the sentence. So given that the rest of the sentence is in the English past tense, or at least as we've translated it because of the Greek aorist, the invisible Amy that we're going to go with is going to be the past tense, or therefore the imperfect form. So blind were the people, literally translated. Probably we would put in English, the people were blind. Um, because we do tend to stick pretty rigidly to the word order. Though you can imagine saying, can't you, blind were the people. And in Greek, you've got that there for perhaps a, a note of emphasis. You're putting the adjective up front in the clause to em emphasise blind were the people. Anyway, there we are. So what we've got so far without the men and the death is God sent the prophets, the people were blind. Right, now we come to the money part of this little section where we consider what do you do with men and death? Here's what I want to encourage you to do, at least to start with. Translate it woodenly, like this. On the one hand, men, but on the other hand, death. Let me show you how, how I mean. So, on the one hand, comma, God sent the prophets, but on the other hand, comma, the people were blind. The reason for highlighting this for you, most of the time when you find a men, it won't mean indeed, as it suggests at the top of page 106, it will be paired with de. You might even talk about, and some of your teachers will talk about, a men de clause. And a men de clause, or men de sentence, strictly, because both the two clauses, because there are two verbal, uh, two verbal clauses in this sentence, uh, uh, men de sentence is a sentence which contains a strong contrast, or a marked contrast of some kind. 
So the way to highlight that in English is on the one hand, but on the other hand, that's very wooden, I realise that. But if you do that, whenever you find a men, look ahead and try and find a de, and then write on the one hand, but on the other hand, write that in there. That will then give you the structure and the shape of the sentence and you can fit everything else around it. That's only a gloss, however. What you really want to do, having put that in, is now think, well, how people actually say this in English. This is a, a wooden translation, on the one hand, uh, on the other hand, one, not one. Um, how would we say this in English? And you'd probably say something much more simple, just retaining the but. God sent the prophets, but the people were blind. That's probably how you'd say it. But, um, uh, again, if you keep that on the one hand, on the other hand, that will then uh, help you to understand what's going on in the structure of the sentence. Just one final note about this, of course. You know already that de can mean but. It can also mean and. Um, it can mean but or and. One way of thinking about men and de is that men highlights the contrastive character of de. So de can mean but in some circumstances. When it's paired with men in a men de sentence, it's definitely going to mean but because it's contrastive in that kind of way. So again, look out for if you spot a men, find the de that it goes with. If there is one, which there normally will be, give it on the one hand, but on the other hand, then do the rest of the sentence and then you'll see how it falls out when you translate it more naturally. Let's come back in a second and do the next example. Hi, OK, now let's just look at these final couple of examples. First, the use of de and then the use of kai. Actually, we'll do them the other way around because I've got de here and kai here. These are from uh, two more examples in practice 9.4. Let's do number three first. Ho theos phile kai tus ponerus. Ho theos phile kai tus ponerus. Let's just translate this first. We'll ignore the kai because this is the word that I want to uh, tell you a little bit about. Um, ho theos phile, God. Oh dear, writing it in Greek. God loves tus ponerus, the evil ones, question mark. So, God loves the evil ones, question mark, becomes, does God love the evil ones? And then, let's deal with this little word here, kai. Well, you know what kai means. Kai normally means and. However, it doesn't always mean and. Sometimes it can mean also or even. And the way to work out which it is, is simply to try translating it as and. And if it doesn't work, then try translating it as also or even. Let's see how that works out in this sentence. Does God love and the evil ones? Clearly nonsense, right? But also even. Do, do either of those work? Does God love also the evil ones? Does God love even the evil ones? Right. There you can see which one of those is going to make sense. In fact, probably both of them will make sense. Even is probably just preferable in English. One final thought. Tus panerus um, uh, might be better to translate that the evil people or just evil people without the article. It's certainly more idiomatic in English, but you can see what it means. It's referring masculine plural. Uh, masculine can be used in general, both of men and women in this kind of context. So it means something like evil people. Does God love even evil people? And finally, here's a use of de, which will be unfamiliar to you, but is actually quite common and is quite significant. It's right here in example number four. Come to that in a second. And it's the use of de along with ho to change the grammatical subject of the verb in the clause. I'll show you what that means as we translate this example. Let's look at it together first. Uh, we'll read it. Oh, I've put the wrong breathing in there. Oh dear. How about that? That's better, isn't it? <laughs> ho Yosef lege auto ho de uk akuse. Ho Yosef lege auto Hot de uk akuse. Right, so what's going on here? Well, let's just translate the text first. 
Um, Lege, is a verb, he speaks, says, or tells. Hot Yosef, Joseph, Joseph is the subject. So Joseph speaks alto, dative singular, to him, very familiar. Joseph speaks to him, full stop. Then let's ignore hode just for a second and translate the rest of this. Uk akuse. Uk negates a verb, and here's the verb it negates, akuse. That's akuo in the future tense. Notice the sigma suffix here. Akuso, akuseis, akuse, third person singular. So he will hear. So he will not hear. Not hear because of the uk. Right. So what then does hot de do? Well, a couple of things are possible here. It's certainly possible that de in this context could mean but. Recall, as we've mentioned previously, that de in general can mean and or but. It, the Duff mentions if it's it's a, a weak but in comparison with ala, which is a strong but. So it could mean but here. But, no pun intended, the real significance of this is that the grammatical subject has changed. Notice, who is the subject of this verb? Answer, for Yosef, Joseph. Well, who is the subject of this verb? The one who will not hear. It's actually the him. Joseph speaks to him, but he, the one whom Joseph is speaking to, will not hear. So we've got a change of subject. Now, Greek notes a change of subject or marks a change of subject in this way or can mark it in this way. This is actually uh, the beginnings of uh, something I've mentioned uh, on and off in previous videos, a discipline called discourse analysis, which is the formal attempt to analyse the the shape and the structure of uh, larger scale structures of text and to, um, to see how uh, the narratives flow, for example, and how you uh, uh, pick up subtle hints and so on, uh, nuances in prose writing, and there are similar techniques in uh, poet poetic writing as well. Well, one of the things that you need to do when you're analysing discourse is to uh, n note when the subject of a verb is changing, and this is how Greek does it with hot air. So in this case, Joseph speaks to him, and, or but, he will not hear. And the choice, of course, between and and but will be determined by contextual consideration. So in this case, probably but makes most sense because it's contrasting or drawing attention to something which is um, unexpected or uh, or changes direction, so to speak, in the sentence. Joseph speaks to him, but he will not hear. So there you are, you've got those slightly new, uh, or completely new, and in some cases quite common uses of these conjunctions. We've got to the end now of chapter 9, so that's fantastic work. Well done if you've persevered this far. We're going to look in the next video just at some examples, uh, just to ingrain some of this stuff you've been doing in this chapter, and then we're back, in, we're back into the next chapter, in double figures in chapter 10 in the video after that, when we will be looking at complex sentences, that is sentences which involve relative pronouns and so on. So uh, check in for the next couple of videos and you'll see where we're going with that. In the meantime, 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week, keep going, keep working hard, and we'll have you reading the New Testament in Greek in no time at all. Bye for now.